Did that extra hour of sleep help everybody? Yes. All right. Hour of sleep. I just woke up regular time. I went to bed six hours early, so I got another so seven hours. You know, if I don't get if I don't get nineteen hours of sleep, I'm no good. So. That hurts, brother. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, if you reach into your uh, bulletin, you'll see uh, lesson two on our series. We're talking about historical Christian evidences. I think you're going to love this study. Um, we're just getting started with it. Uh, with it. And uh, last week in Lesson 1, we talked about the danger of subjectivism. Sub subjectivism is basing a belief on how you feel. That, it's that simple. I feel that Jesus is my Savior. What's the problem with that? I feel that Muhammad is the prophet of God. Or I feel that Confucius. So we can't prove things based on how we feel. Now, and we brought this out last week. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you can't have feelings. But feelings come after an understanding, okay? After we understand, after we, under, after we know what the Scripture is saying to us, or after we know what our obedience is, then certainly feelings come, okay? So subjectivism is not something that is good, and we don't want to give ourselves over to it. The second thing we talked about is... Um, God's word is our standard of truth. It always is. Romans 1, 22, uh, John 17, 17, John 12, and verse 48, 2 Peter 1, 20, 21. All of those set the clear understanding that the word of God is where, um, or is what we base our truth on. And I like John 17, 17, because I think it really speaks to the heart of the importance of God's word. Sanctify them in thy truth. Truth. Thy word is truth. Do you see the connecting? See how it goes together? There's truth and there's truth. How is that truth developed through the word of God? It comes to us from God. Sanctify them in thy truth. Who's God's truth? For thy word, the inspired word that we have, is true. Okay? So we, we looked at that. Uh, this morning, we're looking at our lesson two, and we're talking about the historical reliability of biblical archaeology. Now, if you remember, I said this also last week. I said that we're a people of faith. We're a people of understanding. And certainly we base that faith that we have on those things that are recorded for us in Scripture. So what I'm not saying is if we, can't, if we have something or someone mentioned in the Scriptures, but we don't have any mention of them outside of the Scripture or in historical documents, then that person must not have existed. That's not what we're saying. Okay? We accept the scriptures by faith that what they're saying is true, right? They're inspired by God, right? But there are certain individuals who are listed outside of the scriptures that, that lend credibility to those things that are written in scripture. Right? We're talking about historical Christian evidences, okay? So there are things. Why does that matter? Because it proves that the Bible, we're looking at the New Testament right now. We'll look at Old Testament next week. It proves that the Bible is a is a um, uh, that the, the um, that Christianity is a historic uh, belief that is based in real space and time. These people really lived. They really did the things that are recorded for us. They really said the things that they said. So that gives us a clear understanding of how important the scriptures are. Let's talk about Luke. If you turn over to Luke chapter one. Um, um, Biblical archaeology there, I'll give you the definition. Uh, it involves the recovery and scientific investigation of the materials, of uh, material remains of past cultures that can illuminate the periods and descriptions in the Bible. Archaeology and the writing of Luke. Uh, the Gospel of Luke mentions specific individuals, places, and various official titles of local authorities that have been confirmed by archaeology to have existed. Um, in Luke 1, 1 through 5, we can see that facts are important to Luke. Now, when you look at the, the New Testament, Luke is your historian, okay? Luke is the historian. Remember, it, uh, it seemed good to meet Theophilus, and then you, he picks up in the book of Acts, and he talks about those things. So, so Luke is the New Testament historian. So he gives us the most detail about what happened 
in that first century. The book of Acts is, is a book of conversions. It tells us how the gospel spread, right? It tells us what they taught. It tells us the difficulties they, that they had. Luke is a historian. How is Luke that historian? That's the question. How is he? Well, look at Luke chapter 1. And I want you to notice what he says beginning in verse 1. And I'm using the King James Version. There's, a, there's some slight differences in the New King James. Um, ASV is pretty much the same. Um, but I, I want to highlight something that he says. He says this. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are mo most surely believed among us, there's things that they believed, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. There were those who walked with Christ, who understood Christ, who knew Christ. There were those who saw the miracles that were performed. There are those who in their time knew the color of his eyes, the texture of his beard, the length of his hair, the sound of his voice. Okay? It's a real space-time belief. Jesus really existed. He was really alive. Okay? He says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also. Now, before we think, well, that's a little snobbish of Luke to single out himself and say, well, you know, I'm going to give you the definitive understanding. But notice how he says that. He says, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. That's huge. That, that is absolutely huge. Uh, verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things uh, wherein thou hast been instructed. Perfect understanding comes from the Greek tone, the, tone, the, tone. It comes from the Greek that means per, uh, that all, all knowledge, all understanding. Um, and so Luke is appealing to divine inspiration. He's appealing to divine inspiration. Luke is telling us there in verse 3 that he is speaking of those things, that he is passing on to the, them those things that were revealed to him all the way back to the very beginning. All right? I would take that as, as he's talking about the, uh, Jesus, I think that would go all the way back to his birth. I think it would include John the Baptist as the herald. And I would think it would include everything all the way up until the time that Luke is writing. Luke doesn't give us any prophetic utterances. He talks about blessings that are going to be, be ours. But Luke keeps his understanding to those things that have been revealed to him. Ton teleon, that's the word. Ton teleon, perfect understanding. So Luke isn't guessing. Luke also, and there's some theories out there. there there's one theory that is called Mark, uh, Mar, uh, uh, Markian priority. And that they take Mark as the gospel that was written first, and then uh, Luke and John, um, they, and Matthew, they borrowed from, from Mark's gospel. Well, that's not the claim that Luke makes. I don't think that's true, but that's not the claim that Luke makes at all. Luke sets himself apart. Luke says, having had tantelion, perfect understanding. The only way that I know a man can make a claim that he has perfect understanding is because the Holy Spirit is revealing these things to him, and the Holy Spirit is. Okay? He's an inspired penman writing about these things. That, so here's this historian, right? Right? Here's this man who's going to lay out in his gospel and then going to pick it up in the acts of the apostles and the things that they were doing, the, the birth of the church. Here's a man who we can trust, who, can, who we can rely on. Now, here's what some people say. Wow, that's awful kind of uh, you know, snobbish of him to make that claim. I mean, that's kind of, you know, why is, you know, that's going a little bit over. Luke in this gospel in Acts, never apologizes for the things that he's been taught. He never apologizes. Why should he? He's being led by the Holy Spirit. So when you begin there in Luke chapter 1, specifically verses 3 and 4, that gives us a very clear understanding that we want to pay attention to what Luke is saying in the historical record, and we're going to look at that, um, because he has this perfect understanding. 
Um, go down. So that's the Gospel of Luke. The first one, if you go to chapter 3, and we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit this morning, and we're looking at Luke's references to historical events. Okay, Luke's references to historical rent. Uh, um, um, uh, Whatever, it's historical. <laughs> Luke chapter 3 and verse 1. You have the mentioning of people who were actually, that were alive in the first century and people that were discussed outside of the scriptures in historic literature. Okay, he says this. Now, chapter 3. Now, in the 15th reign, excuse me, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, that's a real historical person, uh, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Harold being Tetrarch of Galilee, this is real historical people, right? And his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene, Ananias and Caiaphas, uh, being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. He mentions a whole list of historical individuals. Um, I know that at the end there, he's going to bring up two priests of that time. Um, but he's mentioning people who really existed in time. Okay? He really existed. I'm of the belief that the New Testament was completed before A.D. 70. That's me. I take what's called an early dating. So these Gospels are being written pretty early, the 40s and the 50s A.D., Okay? So these are people that could be researched. These are people that one could know about. These are people that he's mentioning that were real. Okay? So there could be those who said, wait a minute, there was no guy we ever heard of as being Herod. Well, they knew this, right? Um, in the historical record, there are those who write contrary to Christianity. Right? They write in opposition to Christianity. Out of all of those things that are written, in two weeks we'll, we'll look at those things specifically. Out of all those things that are written, there's not one individual who puts a question to the people that Luke is mentioning here. Why? Because they were historical people, right? They really existed. If somebody said that these people were made up, they'd call Luke out on it, or other people would write about it. So um, you have here Lysenia, Lysenius, um in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, and he's verified, and I forgot to put on here, I did it on the other ones. He, uh, his existence is verified by an, an inscription that was found um, that dated from 14 to 29 AD. An inscription stating his name. That's, that's outside of the biblical record. So there's historical reliability here that, that Luke is putting forth. Okay? Um, go over to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, and look at verses, uh, uh, or 1928. 1928. And so here, the Pool of Bethsaida, um, it was discovered in 1888, and many examples of silver shrines to Artemis uh, were found. Inscriptions confirm the title of the city as the temple warden of Artemis. Look at verse 29. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. I put the wrong name down there. <laughs> Instead of uh, Artemis, Diana. Uh, 28. And when they heard these things, saying they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Okay, so you um, go down to verse 29. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and uh, Aris Tiscar, uh, men of Macedonia and Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. So here is a listening, and you want to change that there on your outline. Here's a listening to a historical figure. And this historical figure has been proven to be true. There's an inscription that confirms the title of the city where this took place as the temple warden of Artemis, or Diana. Okay? That's a real historical um, writing. Okay? Real historical writing, which proves the words that Luke is saying. Um, in, uh, go back to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and beginning in verses 1 through 3, it says this, Luke 2, 1 through 3. 
And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus um, that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when, when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Now, I understand verse 4 was we're a people of faith who understand this, that Joseph and his story, what happens, and of course the birth of Jesus. Later we'll see that people clearly taught that Jesus was a real historical figure. But here we have the understanding that in this time, the historical record says, you know what? Luke is right. There was a census that took place. Um, the census began under uh, Augustus uh, pro pro approximately every 14 years. And this is confirmed by the edict of Viabus Maximus. He's a Roman prefect of Egypt in 104 AD. Okay? He says this, It is necessary for all who are for any cause whatsoever um, what, away from their administrative divisions to return home to comply with the customary ordinance of enrollment. What Luke said here could be verified. Okay? It could be verified by the scriptures. Well, that's just three things so far. And he's right on point. Again, people could have disputed this. People could have said it's not true. But nobody outside the scripture and writing historical material ever confronted Luke on these things. Not one. And like I said, if you take 45 to 56, wherever you want to date the, the book, these people were very much alive during the same time that this census took place. And they could have said, that's a lie. I never had to go back to my home city and be counted, right? Historical reliability of biblical archaeology, all right? Um, we looked at Luke chapter th uh, 3, and we looked down there at verse 2, um, and we see Ananias and Caiaphas being the high priests. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, Okay? And so Caiaphas, mentioned as the high priest here, um, there was an ossuary, which is a, um, it's, a it's a repository for bones. And it, it's, it's a box. Do you remember? Um, it was a couple of years ago that they found an ossuary, this box. Um, they were made of wood. Some of them had lead covers on them. Um, and they said that they had found an ossuary with the name of Jesus on it. And remember, it caused a big uproar because they said, oh, look, we finally found the remnants of the body of Jesus. He, I guess he didn't ascend into heaven. I guess his flesh was left here to decay. Jesus is an extremely popular name <laughs> during the first century. Okay, very common. And it turns out that it was a fake. And then there was another one that was uncovered that said James, the brother of Jesus. I don't know the final outcome of that one. I haven't followed up on it. But these ossuaries are, are things that were popular there because when you moved, you wanted to take your loved one with you. The same thing happens in the Old Testament. Um, so you want to take it with you. So these, these boxes uh, were used. So diggers uncovered an ossuary with the inscription, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. And this marked the first archaeological evidence that the high priest Caiaphas was a real person. Well, you and I take it by faith that he was real. You and I take it by faith of all the people that were high priests before God, um, going all the way back to the Old Testament. We don't doubt that. It doesn't matter if they would have never found this ossuary. We are people of faith. We live by faith and not by sight. We take it. However, here's another example of historical inscriptions that confirm a scriptural reference, okay? Christianity is a real space-time religion. It started for real in a specific place with people adhering to it, all right? It's real. Jesus really lived in space and time, okay? He, he had the five senses like everybody else. He could be touched. He could hear his voice. Um, he was a real person, okay? And, and this archaeology is just beginning to confirm these things. Now, again, let me remind you of what Luke said there. Luke said that he had this perfect understanding. And I trust by faith that if Luke had a perfect understanding, and, and he did, that these are going to be found to be historical people. He's writing a history, brethren. 
It's right in the history. Um, it's just like your history book that you had in, in uh, high school. You know, and you studied the history of the Old West, and you studied the, the, the great cattle trails, and you studied the founding fathers, and, you know, you studied World War II or whatever. Um, those were from historical accounts, okay? Historical accounts. So we are losing at a very uh, rapid uh, pace um, the World War II generation. I mean, by far the vast majority of them passed away. My dad was in Vietnam, and he'd be 81 years old today. So you have those of the Vietnam era, of course, Korea, and the Vietnam era who are passing away. Here's why that matters. What we're going to have left eventually is the testimony of these individuals who were really there. Now, I know people write all kinds of books about historical events. That's fine. But we are losing the people who were actually there. I want to hear a story about D-Day, but it's something to hear it from a historian who's writing back in time and saying things that have been passed down. It's altogether different from a man who said, yes, I, 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 I was on Omaha Beach. I was there. I experienced it. I can tell you this, that firsthand account of what takes place is very important. Luke is giving a first-hand account. These people were there. These people lived. Pontius Pilate it had, had a meeting with Jesus Christ. It happened in real time, in space and time. So we, we have to remember those things. Those who are eyewitnesses always have the best credibility. You know why? Because a lot of historians... Um, will change things to suit whatever the popular belief is or understanding. Let me give you an example. For year, it, the book's called, um, oh man, I read Jefferson Lies that was a rebuttal basically. Um, for years, people who wrote books about um, Thomas Jefferson denied the fact that he had a relationship with one of his slaves, Sally Hemming. They rejected it outright. They said it demeaned. Um, Thomas Jefferson, and he would never do that. And then the historical record began to show, as people did research, oh, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> it turns out this is a, a possibility. And then, several years ago, they began to do the DNA testing. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, this is even more credibility. I don't, see, a lot of people don't like that. And so you have people that even though there's been this evidence presented, you have people who are writing biographies or histories about Jefferson, and they just flat out deny it. This is what you happen, happens when you don't have the firsthand accounts. Um, people change it. Look, to the victor goes the right to write history, okay? To the victor. The, the largest material written about World War II is written from people from the United States. In 1980, uh, there was a, a 1990, there was a uh, friend of mine, a family from 39th Street, and a high school senior, and she said something about uh, winning the Vietnam War. And I said, what? I said, well, yeah, that's, you know, it's here in their history book. In her history book, it said that the United States won the Vietnam War. Plain simple. And that's as, as false as it can be. Not entirely. Well, in 1972, when Saigon fell, yes, it fell but, after the United States had withdrawn for over a year when the Paris Peace Accords were signed and the soldiers came home. Now, I know there's that familiar picture of a, of a helicopter hovering over the embassy and there's soldiers in it, but those people were evacuating South Vietnamese leaders and generals. So the United States had been gone for almost two years. South Korea was defeated, I mean, South, uh, South Vietnam was defeated itself. Um, and so, you know, yeah, it fell, it, it, but we weren't there. It fell, but we weren't there. Right. So, right. Uh, but that's, uh, this history book said basically we were saying that we were, a, we were the ones that won the war, and it, yeah. it, it isn't true in, in that aspect. Yeah, I, I, I know my dad was in Vietnam, so the, the, the history that I have about it is, of course, from, from his firsthand accounts. But, um, you know, 
my dad was there for the Tet Offensive, which was the, the biggest major offensive that North Vietnamese ever put on in, in um, Vietnam. And it's heralded in the, in the history books, you know, this greatest offensive of the war. There's only one problem with it. It was a failure. The Tet Offensive was a failure. The American killed over 50,000 Vietnamese in the Tet Offensive, and there was only 50,000 Americans killed in the yeah. whole war, which the, was a shame because we walked out on it. But. Yeah, um, you know, it's, they didn't beat us out of South Vietnam. We said, listen, we've had enough, man. You guys, we've been fighting for you guys. It's the same thing in Afghanistan. 19 years, yeah. 19 years, eventually reached a point where we said, listen, we've been training you for over 20 years. It's time for you to take care of this, not for us. And if the U.S. troops pull out and Afghanistan falls again, it's not because we were beat, right? But anyway, here's why, that, here's why that's a good point. Here's, here's why it's a good point. Because a first-hand account of history is always more reliable than somebody who is writing by looking back. And that's the story of Thomas Jefferson, and that's the story. And so I said, to the victors goes the right to write history. Now, I'm not doubting America's place in World War II. They were losing. Europe had been captured, except for Spain. They were neutral, so Germany could pass their gold around the world. But anyway, um, so, so they were, had been fighting many years before the United States got into the war, all right? But... <laughs> Most kids grow up thinking that America fought all those battles and won the war in Europe all by themselves. Now, Philippines, yeah, but we didn't. We didn't fight by ourselves <laughs> in Europe, all right? We had at least six other nations fighting with us. We by far had the largest army. But um, so you, you have within the historical record those people who were there and write about it and those people who are writing looking back. The people who are writing looking back nine times out of ten have a personal agenda. And that's good in the Thomas Jefferson history. They had a personal agenda. Yes? Well, if you go back to 1948. I was. Let me see how old I was. You, you can't go that far back. But yeah. the history books in the North different than the history books in the South on the Reconstruction. So, you know, who was right? Somewhere True. in between, probably. But True. The, the point is, you're, what the points you're making is that people looking back put a different perspective on it than those that were actually there. Right. You know, Grant died of throat cancer uh, a month. I don't know, real quick, after his autobiography. It was published after his death, but he wrote his own autobiography, not with a ghostwriter or anything. And there's a famous picture of him. If you Google Grant, he's sitting on his front porch, and he is wrapped up head to toe. In co it's because of the cancer. He was free. It wasn't cold outside. I mean, he was cold. Um, and he gives one of the best firsthand accounts of the Civil War. Well, he was there. He fought on the battlefield. He was a leader. He came up with a strategy. And so it's always great to have those first-hand accounts, okay? It's always great. What we're seeing from Luke's perspective is there are people who had first-hand accounts of these individuals. So here's what I mean. When you talk about there being these historical people that, that Luke uh, writes about, there were those who, who saw those things and knew those individuals on the first hand. So Luke, of course, is writing through inspiration, uh, but he is putting within these things that are, he's talking about through inspiration, he is putting in accurate um, historical people, okay? Um, people who were there firsthand, right? Um, turn over to the back, Sir William Ramsey, uh, historian. He says, one of the, one of the outstanding um, uh, Near East Eastern archaeologists says this, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, he is possessed of the true historic sense. He fixes his mind on the idea and the plan that rules in the evolution of history and proportions the scale of his treatment to the importance of each incident. He seizes the important and critical events and shows their true nature of greater lengths. In short, this author should be placed among the very greatest of historians. 
I agree 100%. Now, does the world agree with that? No, 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 no. Even though his stuff is being proved historically that these people, Herod and Pontius Pilate, they found a coin to Pontius Pilate. Everybody denied that he ever always existed until they found a coin with an inscription on it that says Pontius Pilate. Okay, so I mean, Luke, he's right. Luke is, should be considered up there with the world's great historians. Okay, should be. Um, let me tell, tell you about some recent archaeological discoveries. Okay, and these are just some things to kind of show you the connection. Um, in December of 2014, Science Daily, uh, um, these are, these are well-respected and very well-written uh, publications by people who have PhDs in um, um, history and, and New Testament theology and thing. I'm not saying you have to have that, but these magazines aren't just thrown together by anybody, okay? They have some high standards. So in December of 2014, Science Daily reported the finding of six seals believed to lend credibility to the existence of the kingdom of David and Solomon. Such data piggybacks on other finds, such as the Tel Dan inscription, which is the first historical evidence of King David from the Bible. So here's what you have from the Old Testament. Um, and we're going to talk about some of these writings when we look at individual people. Um, here's what you have. In the Old Testament, they wrote on scrolls, of course, papyrus, right? Okay. But they also recorded history on tablets, on stone. Why? Well, they lasted. Okay? And so what we discover throughout all these years is we discover these tablets. Okay? And when we read these, these tablets, we um, see historical events that are not being recorded by a biblical writer, but they are listing people that affirm what the biblical writer said. So Luke didn't write, you know, on this stone on the Tel Dan inscription. Luke didn't write it. Somebody in history wrote it, and it gives credence to the very things that are written in the New Testament. And it's true. People doubted that there was ever a king named David. And you're like, how in the world could that ever happen? All that he did to rule um, Israel and all those things, how, how could people deny? Well, um, there arose not a generation that knew who. No, David, remember? There arose, or no, wait a minute. Is that Joseph? That's Joseph. Who was in captivity in uh, Egypt? Joseph. So there, it says this, there arose a generation that knew not Joseph. That's just one generation removed from the events, and they didn't even know him. They didn't know what Joseph did. They didn't know how Joseph ruled. They didn't know Joseph's uh, uh, of being sold and then winding up in jail and then uh, winding up serving, you know, all these things. They, they had forgotten all of that, but it's a generation. It doesn't say several generations later. One generation. So that means their parents were alive during all those things. And evidently, that information didn't get passed down. So there arose, over a period of time, a generation that didn't have any idea who Joseph was. Now multiply that throughout events in the Old Testament. It happens. It happens. A generation isn't defined. Usually a generation, how we do it today, a generation um, is, when, is when, like, when, my, when my parents, when my grandparents um, had my mother. So she was of the baby boom generation. So when one generation begins to pr uh, produce grandchildren, you have a shift. We have millennials today. We have um, Xers today. Um, we, we count this when, you know, my, my daughter um, is of her own generation. My son is a millennial um, of a different generation. So there's not a year placed on it. It's that generation that comes from another generation. I think I told you this in the first lesson. Um, when we talk about there arose not a generation that knew Joseph, um, there is a rising in the churches of Christ, a generation that know not the truth. Okay? That know not the truth. And I think I told you this. What is helping the New Testament church, churches of Christ, what is helping to keep them, by and large, faithful congregations, is the World War II generation. The Korean generation, 
That's the generation. What happens? The baby boomers have left the churches of Christ. The baby boomers have not stepped up to the mantle of leadership. That's why you have the World War II generation. It skips, by and large, the baby boomers. It comes down to my generation. And I'm just 50. Baby boomers are, you know, way up there. So that sounded bad for those who are baby boomers. Sorry about that. Um, but you, you see, we've missed a generation. There arose not a generation that knew about New Testament Christianity. How did that happen? Well, you want to put some blame on the World War II generation? Do you want to put some blame on the, the baby boomers not being committed or, or what? I'm a bridge generation. You know what that means? I'm a bridge generation. That means I know about the, the, the World War II and Vietnam era and all that because my mother was alive during that, and so she's taught me, so I know that. But the generation after me, they, didn't, they don't even know who Dobie Gillis is. Who? Yeah, my uncle, I was named after him, Donald, Donald Gellis. The, the, he grew up being called Doby because that was popular in his generation, the TV show. My kids have no inkling of who Doby Gellis is, right? They don't know. So you have these gaps. You have these gaps. You see the same thing happening in sec secular history. You know, this generation of kids come in college now, they don't understand problems of socialism. True. They didn't live at the time that it was in Russia and, and destroying people. And they think now it's a wonderful thing, which it's right. not. It, it's always the elite and, and those way down here. I see these kids with shirts that have Che Rivera's picture on him. He was a he was a I don't want to say communist. But he was not a good person. And that generation just doesn't understand that that's the stupidest thing you can put on your shirt and walk around with. They don't understand socialism. They don't understand those things. It's like wearing a shirt with, uh, with Castro on it. You, you know, there's a history there that people don't understand. You know, Bob Marley. Everybody loves Bob Marley. Well, there's a history there that they don't understand, right? Um, but anyway, so um, these are just some things. I've got, what, five minutes? I stop at ten 10.45? Uh, oh, I mean, 10.15. I'm looking at the clock. 10.15. I'm still on yesterday's time. In September of 2015, uh, Popular Archaeology, great magazine. It's too expensive, but it's a great magazine. Sometimes if you go, do we have high, high, half price bookstores around here? Um, they have, in their bookstores, they have a section of magazines. Most of them are junk. Uh, but they carry uh, Biblical Archaeology uh, magazine, and you can go and buy it for a buck. It's really great, really good magazine. Uh, Popular Archaeology reported on the discovery of the biblical city of Sodom. According to archaeologists, excavations show that the city came to a sudden, inexplicable end, and that the city... Um, and that the city palace was the scene of a fiery conflagration is destroyed. Facts interesting considering the biblical account portrays the city as suddenly destroyed by fire. So what you can glean from this historical um, research is that God smite them right in the center of their, their leadership. Right in the center he destroyed them. You know, so that was Sodom wasn't, was said that it didn't exist until this came around. Um, in December of 2015, this one is huge. Uh, Popular Archaeology again reported the discovery of an imprint from the seal of Hezekiah, an ancient Judean king described in a number of Old Testament writings. The seal is believed to be from later in Hezekiah's reign and depicts a winged son, which seems to co coincide with the biblical account of his illness and recovery in Isaiah 38 and verse 6. Let me tell you what this didn't say. Um, they found this tunnel that Hezekiah had built for the siege of Jerusalem. They needed water. So he built this tunnel that actually went out underneath the walls. Okay, They were digging. This is before 2015. They were digging. And they got to this tunnel. And they didn't know how far it went. But when they got to this certain part, there was a, there was a stone with a carving on it that said Hezekiah's um, tunnel. 
So during the lifetime of that, that uh, tunnel being built, the men gave it, uh, inscribed it saying, hey, this is Hezekiah's tunnel. So again, history confirms those things that are recorded in Scripture. I mean, yeah, history uh, um, uh, confirms those things that are written in Scripture. Now, I'm not saying that every historian believes, but there is a lot of credence, uh, credence to be given. Um, the last section here, known archaeological discoveries. Um, you've heard of these. You've probably seen these pictures in textbooks and stuff. There's the Arch of Titus um, around 82 AD. And what this shows is it's important because it shows the destruction of Jer Jerusalem is constantly being destroyed. Constantly. You know, there was the temple in the wilderness that was made with a tent. There was the temple that was built in Jerusalem uh, that was destroyed. There was what we call the second temple period that was during the life of Jesus. And, of course, Jerusalem is destroyed again in AD 70. It doesn't recover in, uh, during the Crusades and everything. And, by the way, you talk about history. Christians lost the Crusades. They weren't really New Testament Christians. Seven major, uh, seven major Crusades and about six minor ones. In fact, there was one crusade where they got all the children to fight. Christianity didn't fare well in the Crusades. You know how you know? Islam captured every single Christian site. What stands on the remains of the temple? A mosque. You see why Jews and Muslims don't get along even today? Imagine if we went down there and built uh, a church on the top of um, uh, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. That's what it's like. So um, the, the Arch of, of uh, Titus is very interesting. Um, it's a picture, it's carved, showing the sacking of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. Um, and depicted in this drawing are the menorah and trumpets, as well as what might be the table of showbread. I will add one more thing to that, and historians debate it, but I'm telling you, if you just Google this up and you look at that picture, it sure looks like the Ark of the Covenant is being hauled away. It just looks like the Ark of the Covenant, but it's never been confirmed, okay? We don't, we, we'll, we'll just never know. Um, so those are things. Hezekiah's tunnel and all those things. Um, uh, we just talked about a tunnel created by King Hezekiah in anticipation of the Syrian invasion. It's 550 yards long. It brings water from the Gishon Springs. It's located some 330 yards outside the walls of Jerusalem uh, to the Siloan Pool. Inside the ancient city, it was built to protect the city's water supply during an Assyrian siege. And, well, the Assyrians eventually uh, um, get it over on Hezekiah and things don't end well for him. Um, here's what I say. We have ample proof through archaeology to prove the biblical record. In this lesson, we have looked at the proof for just one book in the Bible. We looked at Luke. There is much more proof from the rest of the New Testament. And we're going to see that as we get through. We're going to look at five, um, uh, um, five pagan writers who wrote about Jesus in history and two Jew Jewish sources that wrote about Jesus in history. So we're working our way to that. Questions? Anybody? Yes. It's coming. Other shoulder. Uh, two quick, two quick things. While sure. there isn't an exact number set to a generation, it is generally accepted to be about thirty years. What uh, what, uh, what time period is that? We live longer now. It's still, <laughs> it's, it's still, it's still uh, generally accepted to be about thirty years for historical, yeah, like determining generations and so yeah. forth. Um, you started off the class referring back to last week's comments about feelings yes. and emotion. Correct. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, we're all familiar with mm -hmm. the fact that they were pricked in their heart. That, that's referring to emotion. Thayer finds it as uh, uh, metaphorically referring to a deep pain within the mind. Uh, but that, that, that came emotion, after the teaching. That emotion before. was based upon what Peter had told Correct. them as he told them about Jesus, who he was, uh, pointed out to them that uh, he was declared by God unto them by the works that he did, the miraculous works, and then said, this same Jesus whom ye crucified, 
pointed the finger at them and said, you're responsible for this. Mm -hmm. It was then that the emotion caused them to say, what do we need to do? What, what must we do? Uh, I, David, David committed sin with Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. He had no remorse about that. Wait. Uh, let me finish. Okay, we're he running had, out of time. He had, no remorse, he had no remorse about that until Nathaniel came to him and pointed out the sin that he was involved in. It was at that time that David said, I've done wrong. It was at that time the emotion, the feeling came in. After he'd been told, this is what you did. Well, you're saying the same thing I said. Emotion follows the truth. And I wasn't arguing with no, you. No, uh, but we covered that last week. You weren't here. But, but emotions always follow the presentation of the truth. Always. What's the problem today? Feelings are being placed first and then the acceptance of the truth. Right? Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. They, two minutes. Oh. They were pricked in their heart after, after Peter preached to them. Okay? Um, the Philippian jailer. Uh, his family rejoiced after the preaching of the gospel and they, they became New Testament Christians. Um, it, I'm not saying feelings are bad. They're, they're not. But I'm saying feelings that are not based on truth are worthless. What did Paul say of, of the Jews? They have a zeal without knowledge. Why would he say that to them when they were the people of God? Because during the New Testament period, they had a zeal, but they had no knowledge because they rejected who Jesus Christ was. So their zeal was no good. Subjectivism, that was their feelings. Their feelings no good. Zeal is a feeling. It's no good. Why? Because they don't have knowledge. Okay. Is that it? We've got to go. We've got to finish it. We're done. Let's have a prayer. Father, we're grateful that we were able to open our, our Bibles and to study your word. We do pray that we will continue as we work our way through this study, Father, that we will continue to grow in our um, understanding of these passages that are being presented to us through Scripture. And of course, Father, we, we rely on Scripture. It's the foundation of our belief. We believe it is the, the, uh, the truth that God's word has revealed to us in this form. And Father, we want to be diligent students of the word. Um, Father, in all that we do, help us to be faithful. Help us to be students. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.